February 7, 2024. Um, present is our uh, committee vice chair, Trustee Alapa, Trustee Akina, Trustee Galuteria, um, Trustee Ahuna, Trustee Souza, uh, Chair Hulu Lindsay, um, Trustee Akaka, and Trustee Trask are all here, as well as myself, to give us the quorum. Um, also joining us Turn it on. is um, our support staff, Crane Akina yes. and Melissa Winahan, Hit it. as well as our Pohana, um, our, uh, I keep... Stacy. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to turn it over to our to our Pohana to um, introduce the other support staff on the teleconference. Let's take a seat. Mahalo, Chair, Vice Chair, Trustees. Joining us today is Interim General Counsel Everett Ota, CFO Ramona Hink, Interim Senior Legal Counsel Nichi Ozawa. Uh, we also have Financial Analyst Grace Chen, Land Director Tim Wong, and IT Systems Engineer and Administrator Dave Kozuki, and IT Systems Engineer and Administrator Kevin Cha. Mahalo. Okay, thank you, Pohana. Um, Members, we do not have any uh, minutes or unfinished business. So we shall move on to new business, which is the consequent capital management investment education session. Um, do we have any testimony on this item, Karen? We have zero registrants to testify on this item. Okay, um, so with this, I, I will turn it over to Stacy to introduce um, the participants, uh, Stacy. Mahalo, Chair. Um, joining us today is Vijoy Chatterjee from Consequent Capital. Aloha Kako, Chair, Trustees, Kapohana, um, aides, um, staff, and other interested parties. Um, thank you again for having a Consequent uh, capital management in front of you today. My name is Vijoy Chatterjee. I serve as the chief investment officer on behalf of uh, Consequent Capital Management. And I, um, our role is to be the consultant, the um, board consultant um, for OHA. And so today um, we're gonna kind of go through the usual routine that we're establishing in terms of appearing in front of the RMC. Um, and so what I would do is I will direct you to a presentation material. The first um, couple of pages are really um, uh, just, a, again, it's sort of an intro, intro and background on our organization, but I think you already um, are familiar with that. So if you could go to page five, um, that's where we're going to start today's session. I'll give a second to get the screen up to page five. So just to um, the first part, what we like to do in our presentations is to review the last time we were in front of you, which was actually only last week. And we had a manager come and present um, Pantheon um, Capital, um, which is a private markets investor for OHA. It has been an investor for some 20 years. And um, it, it has been, I think, about four years since the last time they were in front of you. And so we're trying to establish a a routine of getting your managers in front of you more, more regularly. Um, so we had um, one of their um, senior people come and present. Ryan Lee and I actually met with the manager after the presentation. And so we got further insights into what they're doing and what they have done on behalf of OHA and its other investors. Uh, you recall that they are a global investor. They invest in private equity markets, which include uh, something called primary markets, investing in first uh, funds directly, investing in secondaries, which are taking positions after those funds have uh, come to market uh, when they find good ones, and then doing co-investments where they partner with their investors like in OHA to do an investment into either uh, the fund or a particular project or company within those funds. Um, and those are done at reduced fees. And so all of those sorts of uh, investments are, are um, open to OHA. The last commitment made to Pantheon was actually in 2014. Um, but the investment period is ongoing. So they're continuing to make investments, 
um, in those commitments that were made there, then, and they have, are holding those assets to, um, to maturity on behalf of OHA. So you'll continue to see um, positive returns, we hope, from, from Pantheon over time. Um, that does um, lead us to some um, conversation and questions that we'll bring back in front of the RMC related to the pacing of commitments and the role of the private equity program um, in the portfolio. So if we go down to the um, investment oversight section, that kind of leads into where we're going to go after this meeting. Today's meeting, we're gonna go through some investment concepts. We have a terrific panel of CIOs and former CIOs to talk to you about what they do. Um, but on the 21st of this month, there's another RMC meeting. And so what um, we'd like to do is come back in front of the trustees and present some observations we've made in terms of the um, investment portfolio and the program, as well as your policies. Um, at the March 6 meeting, what we'd like to do is to come back and then make actual recommendations based on those observations. And then sometime after the Common Fund event, when you have your meeting at the, in March, um, we hope that the, the trustees will be able to take action on those recommendations. Um, and um, sort of um, um, make changes to policies as you see fit. In the meantime, but in the course of those meetings, um, it's our intention to meet with um, the trustees individually, with um, staff as well, to make sure that we're all kind of coming onto the same page in terms of what we're seeing and sort of what potential changes, if, if necessary, can be. So we wanna get a lot of input before we make our observations and before we make our recommendations. But that's gonna be kind of the timetable as we move forward. Um, in addition to that, at these meetings on an ongoing basis, we'll continue in, in, to invite your various service providers, fund managers to come and talk about their strategies with you and, and what they do well. And I think that's important before we make any real changes to the portfolio structure, which is separate from the policy structure. Um, we understand you know, what those who those managers are, what they do and how they fit in the portfolio. So that's sort of the game plan. Um, before we go to the panel of CIOs, um, if I could turn your attention to page six of the presentation, um, what I'd like to do is go through a few um, investment uh, concepts. Now, these concepts can be um, very dense and very nuanced, but what I'm going to try and do is to go through them fairly quickly, but to try to present them to you in the perspective of how it's valuable to a trustee overseeing a portfolio, as opposed to getting into the minutia. We can always go into the minutia if you have questions or if you'd like to meet separately. Um, that's something that, that's certainly available in terms of um, sort of ongoing education, you know, a lot of these things, I'm always learning more in terms of these concepts myself, but um, for the purpose of running the portfolio, that's the perspective I'd like to, to do. And again, as an institutional asset allocator, um, the, the key strength of being um, who OHA is, is that you're a long-term investor. Um, there are opportunities that short-term investors can take advantage of, but your strength is that you're investing into perpetuity. And so there are certain kinds of investments that other investors cannot take advantage of because they don't have the long-term perspective that you do. Um, and so we try and capture that. So the, the areas that I'm going to cover uh, is something called compounding returns, volatility, up capture, down capture ratios, distribution of returns, and tail, um, tail risk. And again, we'll move fairly quickly, but if you have questions or again, we can come back and I can speak with you um, individually with your aides, with staff later. So um, if you turn to page seven, there's a lot of uh, information there about compounding returns. And this is really a growth concept. So the reason I'm putting this in front of you is because as an institutional investor, how do you think about growing the portfolio? And um, uh, uh, um, the, the importance of compounding is something that if you go back to Benjamin Franklin, um, in one of the founders of the United States, what he felt and has, is reportedly to have said is that compounding is one of the greatest inventions of human beings um, because of its power to grow assets over time. And in fact, what he had done was back in the, um, the 18th century, he put aside money and 
um, specified that it shouldn't be take, it should be allowed to grow at a compounding rate over time for 100 years and then 200 years. And so in most of, I think, everyone's lifetime here, the distribution of the assets that he put away um, in his lifetime um, grew to about 30 million, which he put aside for the city of um, Boston and the city of, um, of um, Philadelphia. So in 1991, those two cities received the proceeds of that compounding, which was about 30 million. So maybe in, the, in today's numbers, in terms of city budgets, 30 million, hey, that goes pretty quickly. But if you think that that money was just put away and allowed to grow over time, you know, for ourselves, I kind of think of ourselves, if you, if you knew your great grandparents and you end up knowing your great grandchildren, that's almost 200 years if you assume a generation is about 25 years. So within that period, um, the effect of compounding was very impactful. And the importance to you as trustees is that you want your portfolio to grow over time. And those returns will beget um, growth and, further, and so on. And so you always want to be thinking about how do we grow these assets. Um, another example of kind of compounding that a lot of people learn maybe, I don't know, in sixth grade or something, uh, I'm not saying we all learn it, but we, we kind of uh, are exposed to it, is the sort of different types of compounding. And we see that in our everyday lives, maybe if you have a bank account, so you think about you put money in the bank and you earn interest, or you put it into a CD bank, um, CD um, savings account, and it earns a certain amount of interest for a period of time, that money is compounding. That's what the power of earning that interest is. And in terms of um, how the assets are managed within the, the OHA portfolio, um, the important thing to, to keep in mind there is not only that you want to be continuing to grow those assets. Now, you're not growing it in a CD at a bank. You're investing it with fund managers who hopefully are uh, creating um, positive returns. And those positive returns on the portfolio side earn, um, grow, and then those, um, um, that growth, those returns also are in the portfolio and continue to grow. So the portfolio grows over time. The example I give here is sort of $100. If it went up 10% one year, then the next year, if, it, if, if that $110 earned um, is kept in and in, it grows again by another 10%, now you're earning, uh, it, it, the, the portfolio grows from 110 to 121. So the first year you grew $10, the second year you grew $11, and so on and so forth. So compounding is very powerful. But the important part I want to emphasize here is what happens if it goes down? Because unlike a bank account, sometimes the markets go down. And so if the markets go down, the lesson here is that if you had $100 and it went down um, uh, 10%, or, or I guess I put nine, a nine that should be a, a 10%, it goes down to 90, right? Now, in order to get it back to break even to 100, you don't need a 10% return. You actually need an 11% return. So it's an asymmetry just based on the math alone in terms of the importance of upside and downside. And so one thing that we want to keep in mind is that asymmetry. And so for professional investors, while we all wanna participate in the upside, it's really avoiding the downside that is critical. And so as we um, you know, think about ways to manage the portfolio going forward, we wanna really be um, focused in on how can we prevent losses? Because the negative impact of losses in terms of now what you need to return, what you hope to compound at is important. If you lose less than the market or than um, your benchmark, that's actually a good thing. So that's why a lot of professional investors sort of focus in on the downside as opposed to only how, how much can I return? Kind of when you're an individual, you focus in or you're a high net worth, you wanna, oh, I wanna know how much can I earn? How much can I earn? But professionals sort of focus in and sort of say, well, how much can I lose? And am I willing to lose that? So that's the lesson here in compounding. There's a lot of, a lot of words here, but um, that's the main message on that page. If we can turn to the next page, the second concept is volatility. And I know that trustee um, Trask asked last time about the definition of volatility. It wasn't in last time's glossary, but in two presentations ago, we had volatility defined and it's in the glossary in this, um, this document. Volatility, think of it as a dispersion. So if you're trying to get a certain return, the volatility is the movement around that um, expected return. And so one way to think about volatility 
um, is a way to differentiate traders from investors. So you as um, stewards of the OHA portfolio, you wanna be more on the investor side. And so there's different ways to differentiate. Are you a trader, are you an investor? Um, one thing you hear from traders is they like volatility because they can trade around that, they make a lot of money. Now, as long-term investors, as institutional investors, on the whole, you don't want volatility. You want consistency because you want to be compounding positively. You want to know why your portfolio is behaving the way it is. Volatility is a, a measure of uncertainty. That's another way to think of volatility. And the more uncertainty you have in the future of your portfolio, the, the less uh, beneficial that is to you as an institution. Um, now, there's nuances there I should make clear in terms of volatility. In general, I said, you know, traders like volatility, institutional investors don't like volatility. But just like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, if you read that book or read that to your kids, you know, there's always deeper truth in Narnia. So it's actually possible, it, it actually can be good to have volatility in your portfolio, but in a portfolio context. So certain assets are gonna be more risky, have less certain returns, and that's okay in a portfolio context. But in general, as institutional investors, I want you to think that I would much prefer a more certain return than expecting someone to trade around uncertainty. And so um, further down on this page, there are different types of volatility measures. Um, maybe one of the most famous that you would be fa um, familiar with is something called the VIX index, which is um, run by a um, exchange called the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. And sometimes you hear about it in the news, like that's the fear index, because when that's up, that means the markets are fearful of returns. When it's sort of steady or low, then markets tend to be so-called greedy, right? People are trying to generate returns. Um, but these are all different ways to think about volatility. Volatility is something that can actually be traded. It's a, it, in a way, it's an asset class. Um, they, they're traded through options. And usually those options traders are the ones who have the greatest visibility into volatility. I don't have visibility into um, volatility. We wouldn't as an institutional investor, but you can invest with managers who trade that. And so they kind of talk about volatility smiles and they, it's important for pricing options to understand the value of, of the, the measures of volatility. Um, but um, maybe the way to think about it as an institutional investor is if you um, go to the grocery store, right? And you want to buy a, um, you want to buy a, um, a box of cereal um, for breakfast. When you go to the store, you expect that cereal box to be a certain price. Now, if you come back an hour later and the price of that cereal is different than it was an hour, that's the volatility, the price changing. So if every time you went to the cereal section and the price of the box of cereal changed, you don't know what the price is, right? So that's why as a buyer or an institutional investor is the equivalent here, you want more certainty in the assets. You wanna know that box of cereal is gonna be the same box of cereal for the same value day in, day out. Now, a trader, they might actually like that the fact the, the box of cereal um, moves over time. They might say, oh, I noticed that the store discounts the cereal in the afternoon. I guess there are less people buying cereal in the afternoon. They need it for breakfast for the afternoon. So they're trading strategies. They'll say, oh, I only buy cereal on the weekends or in the afternoon because I know they're going to lower the price and then the price is going to go back up. Maybe I'll sell it to you, you know, uh, directly um, for the higher price later and pocket the change. So the volatility is the uncertainty in the price that changes around. And the example of the cereal is if you were a trader and you're kind of trading that cereal box that you um, see in the grocery store. So again, who sets the price? So prices are set generally, you know, in, in an economy like our own, um, they should be set by the market, right? Supply and demand, fundamentals in the long term. But there are a lot of things that can happen to prices and volatility of prices in the short term, right? You can have, um, someone could try and corner the market. The government could intervene and put in a, 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 a stabilization program or something. So there are a lot of reasons why prices change. But as a long-term investor, again, you're going to prefer um, more stability. Now, there can be parts of the portfolio where volatility can be good in terms of OHA. So there are certain managers that will maybe have a more volatile profile than others. But you really want to, as institutional investors, have some stability because you're investing for the long term. You want that compounding to be positive. 
So there's a lot more in terms of volatility we can talk about, but let's come back to that. Let's go on to the next concept here, which is um, sort of effectiveness is the way I would characterize up and down capture ratios. So what we're, what we're trying to understand, and this is just a measure, and the, it, the measure is defined there, and it's give, there's a formula in terms of how you can calculate your up and down capture. But essentially, it's kind of an effectiveness because if we go and we find a manager, you know, say they're trading stocks for you, and we say, well, what's your up capture and what's your down capture ratios, right? We want to sort of see that. It indicates how much of the market do they capture, do they get in an up market, and how much do they capture in a down market? So it could be 100%. That means it's kind of like the index. If the, if the S&P 500, which was up near 5,000 today, so everyone's getting excited that we're near the $5,000 mark, and your, your manager is capturing all of that 100%, one for one, then they're, they're basically giving you the market return. If they're capturing more to that, then they're doing something that's a, that like they're capturing 110% of return. So the market's up 100, they're up 110. Right? And so you want to know in a positive market, how does a manager perform? So the up capture ratio is a way to do that. Now, the down capture ratio talks about what if the market's down 100 points? Is your um, manager also down 100 points or are they only down 50 points? Or God forbid, they're down 150 points, right? These are all indications of is your manager good in these different markets? How do they perform? And it isn't... Um, like, are they good just by looking at the number? I think I said before, there's no one number that will tell you exactly what's going on. You need to then ask that further question. So, you know, in this last bullet point on the left here, I kind of say, you know, if for long-term avoiding draw drawdowns is important. Um, oh wait, that's not the point. Um, but the idea is that um, the, um, it, it gives an idea of possibly what they're doing, they're doing well. So. If a manager captures 110% of the return on the upside, that's great. We all like positive returns, but are they doing it because they're taking excess risk, like too much leverage? Are they doing it because they just got kind of lucky? They were in the magnificent seven last year, right? Those seven high big tech stocks that went to the moon where everything else kind of stayed sort of stable. But remember as institutional investors, the emphasis is downside protection. It's, we don't want to lose in down markets. So if you're losing 100% in a downside market, then you're kind of doing what the market is doing. So do you have any skill? If you're only losing 50%, you might have skill. That might be something to pay for. Like, hey, in a down market, we're going to lose less, which means when the markets turn around, I'm not compounding from where the market went down to. I'm compounding from 50% higher, you know, which again, over the long term, as an institutional investor, that's what you want to do. You want to lose. You want to gain as much of the upside as you can, but you want to lose less on the downside. So on the right side, this in investo Investopedia uh, example talks about an up capture ratio of 90, which is like 90% of the market is capturing the upside. And on the downside, you'll only capture 70% um, of the downside. It's not 100, it's not 100, but that's actually a good ratio. And then they show you how you can use it. You just divide the 90 by the 70, you get the 1.29, which is an indication that you're generating better returns than the market, both on the upside and the downside. And I'll note that this profile is actually like a particular strategy called a covered calls or cash secured put writing, which is a nice strategy. It's like, let's capture as much of the upside as we can, in this case, 90%. But let's only capture maybe two thirds of the downside, which is kind of like the 70%, right? 66%, 70%. That profile over time as a long-term investor will put you in a very good position to be, if you're a pension fund, to be fully funded or to reach all your goals as, a, as an investor. So that's what up, to, up, up and down capture ratio kind of means for you as institutional investors. Okay, the next page, which is page 10, I'm just gonna to touch a little bit on distribution of returns. And distributions of returns, you kind of see in these bell curve shape um, um, example, right? And um, you have both potential 
and actual returns that they could be showing you. So that's an important question to ask when a manager comes to you. A lot of these private equity managers, when they come, oh, we have an ex expected return of 20% or 18%. It's like, is that an actual return? No, that's an expected return. Okay, well, maybe the question is then, what's the distribution around that return? Your expected return is kind of like the average. That's what you expect to get. That's what the highest point in the, in the graph. But is, what's the shape of that graph? Is it likely that you're gonna get 18, 20% or are you taking some risks? So there's, there's a lot of dispersion around that, that volatility, the, the price isn't really known and you could actually end up with a lot less or maybe a lot more. And as an institution investor, even though you can get maybe a lot more if there's a, if there's a um, wider dispersion of that distribution of returns, you really want the certainty as an investor, because that allows you to run your mission. That allows you to do other things. If you know every year you're gonna get a 10% return from the portfolio, now you can plan all the um, other things that you need to do to fulfill your mission at OHA, right? If you say, well, one year we're gonna have 15%, now we're gonna have 5%, then we're gonna be negative 5% the year. Okay, now that, that um, spending policy becomes important because you're sort of like, well, we don't know what we're gonna do. It could be anywhere from positive 10% to minus 5%. That's good to know, but that's what we're talking about with dispersion of returns. What does that profile look like? And that's a fair question to kind of ask managers. You know, if they tell you, well, we, we expect to get 8% returns over you know, the long term. Okay, well, what is the long term? And what's the likelihood of getting that return? So there are different kinds of um, um, dispersion um, um, charts that you can look at. And I've listed a few here uh, just for your information. And again, we can kind of go into more detail um, later um, about that. And so let me, let me leave that as it is. And then let's come to the final um, topic that I'd just like to cover with you sort of very quickly. Uh, and this is called um, tail risk. It's, it's not tailwind, you know, with the, where the wind's at your back and things are going great. Tail risk is actually something that you want to be aware of as an investor and you maybe want to avoid it. Now, usually, um, you know, what we're talking about with tail risk here are extreme outcomes. So if you think about a distribution, positive is on the right side, negative is on the left side. Everybody loves the positive, right? It's like, oh, we were expecting a 10% return and the manager came back and said, oh, this year we made 20%. Everybody kind of loves that, right? It's like, oh, we got a 20% return. It, it should also cause you to ask questions. It's like, how did you get that so much higher than what we thought, right? Did you do something unusual? Did you take unnecessary risk? But let's put that aside because everybody likes to make more than they thought they were gonna get. It's again, the downside. As institutional investors, what you wanna be concerned about What's that tail risk on the left side of the distribution? And so um, there's a picture there um, and we're trying to manage tail risk. This actually shows something called skew. Um, it's right side skew, it's fat tail skew. So this might be something that, that you like, um, but um, the tail is all the way on the right side. So again, this is kind of in the positive side, but if you see returns like this, you're sort of wondering, well, okay, the central, the expectation is where the peak is on that chart and the stuff to the right are kind of surprises. And again, as, a, as institutional investors or just as human beings, positive surprises or surprises aren't always bad, but as institutional investors, you know, the ideal would be have that certainty. Now we can't have certainty in the world, so we expect sometimes there's surprises, sometimes things we won't expect. But in terms of thinking about how a manager is managing for you, you wanna know like, okay, almost every year you're gonna come in, you're gonna give me a 7% return, that's nice. But every now and then we're down 50%. That doesn't sound too good to me in terms of an investment because that's a big tail risk. Now that tail risk, maybe it won't happen for 50 years. Maybe it happens every two or three years. Those are the kind of questions that you wanna to, um, to drill into because am I, comfortable as a steward for the OHA portfolio to accept that kind of a tail, even if it's un, it, unlikely to happen, are you okay with that? And there are different ways to eliminate that um, left tail risk. So the bottom um, bullet point on the left there, you can kind of eliminate um, that by allocation choices, right? You can say, well, I'm not gonna invest in those strategies because they're just too volatile, they're too risk, I don't, uncertainty. 
that's one thing you can do as a as a trustee, as a steward of the OHA portfolio. Um, you can also diversify. So, okay, this is this strategy has some risk in it, maybe a little higher than other strategies. But if I own a lot of different strategies, presumably you've diversified the portfolio, and that will help to mitigate the risk that maybe that one out of 50 years, the, 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 the strategy doesn't work, but everything else does work. So that, that's a portfolio construction, and that's a diversification. There's also specific hedging strategies that you can use to hedge out. Like, we want to cut that tail off. I'm willing to accept a 3% loss, but I don't want a 5% loss, so let's bring in a manager, or let's make sure the manager can um, 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 hedge that additional downside. So those are things that are possible, and we can talk about that more in terms of what it means for the OHA portfolio. And then the last thing in terms of avoiding the downside is just luck. Some of this stuff is, is just, you just get a little bit lucky and you, you manage to avoid it. A lot of the models, a lot of the analysis um, that goes into some of these metrics here, you really don't get certainty or confidence in the, the metric that comes to you unless you have a lot of observations. And until you have a lot of observations, you don't know, is the manager demonstrating a skill set in avoiding the downside or are they just getting lucky? So that's, that's difficult. But as long-term investors, um, again, I mentioned at the beginning, you have a certain strength, and that strength is that you can hold on to positions and you can manage the portfolio for the long term. And households, day traders, groups like that, they, don't, they can't take advantage of being able to invest over a long period of time to generate their returns for, for different reasons. But that's something that as long-term investors, um, you know, you have to um, consider. So when you make policy, when you choose managers, you don't want to be trying to change them out every year. You want to say, this is the strategy. I understand the risk. I know that some years it's going to be what I want. Some years it might disappoint. But if I believe in the overall structure, then I'm going to be willing to hold that through time. Doesn't mean you wouldn't sell it at some point, but just your approach as institutional investors needs to be sort of grounded in strategic long-term thinking. And that's what these metrics in different ways kind of um, get at. Again, they're, these, these are dense concepts. These are nuanced concepts. What I'm trying to present to you is as a, as a trustee overseeing a fiduciary responsibility, how do you think about these concepts um, in terms of what's meaningful to you? There's a lot more we can learn about it. I'm not trying to teach a, you know, kind of a college course here. I'm just trying to give you some of the tools and the ways to think about um, these concepts. And now you can have conversations with consultants, with managers, um, with your stakeholders about why and how you manage and invest the portfolio. And again, what I'd like to do is I'd come, like to come and meet with you individually, go over some of this, some more field questions. I'll do the same with staff. Um, and, um, you know, we'll continue to make our observations and come back to you with some recommendations um, in terms of your policies, in terms of your portfolio structure, and maybe even um, somewhat to certain managers. So, um, so, so events that happen that aren't sort of, um, that are out on the tails, they can be events that happen every so often. The ones that you're focused in on saying that, you know, extreme events or very unlikely events, um, sometimes in the popular financial literature, they've been called black swans. So black swan, so a black swan comes from the concept that for, um, for the West, for, you know, thousands of years, they only saw white swans, right? And they said, a swan is white. That's it. That's all you get is a white swan. Then they went ahead and sort of colonized. They went to Australia, right? They sort of, and the West went, uh, the Western powers that, that occupied Australia suddenly came across a black swan. That was impossible until they actually observed that there were actually black swans out there because there was never a black swan in the West. Because that's what I'm told. I don't know if that's entirely true, but that's what, that's what we're told. So a black swan event is one of these events that you just don't know is coming, that you, you, don't, you can't conceive of because all your experience is like, I've only seen white swans through history, so there must only be white swans. Suddenly, the black swan changes your world. So 
um, in the financial markets, it would be the kind of event where, you know, the price of a house never goes down. Invest in housing. Housing prices don't go down because everyone forgot that sometimes they do. And then in 2008, we had what we would call a black swan. I mean, prices ha of houses have gone down in history, but nobody is alive who remembers that. And so everyone thought, just invest in a house, you'll be safe, your family will be secure. Then 2008 happens, right? That was considered like a black swan event. Very unlikely and extreme. So um, there is a case, um, and I've invested in strategies that, are, that, that create something called crisis alpha, um, the idea that in a financial crisis, what are strategies that do well because you know your stocks are going down? Is there anything that does well when everything else is going down? Um, and, and that is sort of like if there was a black swan event, how do you protect yourself if you can? I mean, you know, I think every time you have a new data point like that, you kind of say, yeah, it could happen again. There are people right now who are for saying, hey, you're, you're in a housing bubble. Well, there, there's problems with the housing market. There's problems with lending in the housing market. Could 2008 happen again? I think it goes down to that, like, you know, um, I forget who said it, but, you know, history, um, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. So, yes, could markets go down 50% again? Yeah, it could. Um, under what conditions? We probably won't know until we're in the middle of it. And that's why as trustees, as, as institutional investors, you want to build a portfolio that you're comfortable with living through different e examples. Now, the chances of markets really going to another 2008 are low, are minimal, but they're not zero. And as a trustee, you want to say, well, how much am I willing to live with the possibility that what if the markets go down the way they did in 2008? How will our portfolio perform? And is that okay? Right, because after two, it kind of came back, right? Then spend the next ten years coming back up. Um, so those are the considerations that you want to do. You can't eliminate risk entirely in any portfolio, certainly not in the OHA portfolio. But you want to know what those risks are, and then you want to be able to say to yourself, "I accept these risks, but I don't accept those risks." Right? That's like the idea of like, okay, you have a list. This is what I'm willing to invest in. It used to be that. You, you know, the, the, the um, government only let institutional investors invest in bonds. The stocks are too risky. You cannot own stock. You can only own bonds. And so I think even as, as, as late as the 70s or 80s, you know, a lot of institutional investors, they only own bonds, right? Then they real, then over time said, oh, well, stock, that's a certain risk and we can model that and that's okay. So then they allowed groups to invest more in stocks. And now that there's, you know, more diversified alternatives that, that are considered acceptable for institutional investors to invest in, in a portfolio con, um, concept. Um, yeah. Okay, then if it's okay, I think we have three CIOs. Sorry, Trust, oh, Trustee Galateria. I've got a question. Yeah, Thank sorry. you, Chair. Uh, Vijoy, to what degree is long-term investment geopolitical or geographical or even seasonal? Any of these come into play? I mean, I'm talking like world conflicts, that sort of thing. How does that affect us long-term investors? Yeah, so it's a challenge, right? Because I think uh, Keynes, uh, the economist, the 20th century economist sort of said, you know, what good is it if, you know, you, you're, you're investing for when the, the oceans are calm and, you know, you know they're going to be calm again, but in the tempest when things are going crazy, you don't have anything to say. So there is a balancing that you have to do in terms of like their short, shorter term and acute risk in the, in the um, markets that could have a dramatic impact on your portfolio versus, hey, I'm a long-term investor. I don't have to worry about this. You know, some of us might've been around in 1987 and you remember that Black uh, Monday when the market sort of sold down and that was thought, oh, we're headed to another depression. Well, if you just ignored that event and you just held on, the markets have run way up. So it's kind of like, was that, that was a very acute and challenging event at the time for a lot of us, but it didn't last and staying invested for the long term meant that you did very well. No guarantee it worked out that way. We could have gone into another Great Depression, but it didn't for various reasons. So as a, as a long term investor assessing these sort of risks like geopolitical or should I not be investing in China right now because the Chinese market is going down, but it's the second biggest economy. Should I invest? Um, what you want to be thinking about is, you know, 
are these shorter term, potentially transitory events, which may last years, um, are they something that we can stomach or we can handle? Like for example, like if I have pension benefits to pay out, well, I wanna manage the portfolio so that suddenly if the markets became illiquid or I lost 10% you know, of the portfolio, can I still pay my pension beneficiaries, right? That's the way you think of like, okay, how do we adjust or manage these sh the short-term stresses for our long-term object uh, objectives? Now you as OHA, um, you run programs, right, with, the, with the, the assets. You draw on that and you run your programs. So you wanna make sure that however your programs are funded through the portfolio, that portfolio contribution is there year in, year out because it would be tragic not to be able to run those programs. So those are the, that's the way to think about those short-term risks. Is there some event in the short term, like if the housing market went down again and it goes down 20%, 50%, how would that affect my ability to run the different OHA programs over time? If there's enough liquidity, if there's enough um, uh, um, um, assets to continue to run those programs, then that's acceptable. If you have to, if you, if you can't run them because of the kind of investments you're making or um, you don't have enough liquidity, then you might think, oh, well, what if markets went down, you know, 50%? How do we deal with that? If it went down 10%, not a problem. So I'm, just, I'm trying to give you different ways to think about it. I don't know if that helps. Like just stay the course. Well, that's We're often what folks care. will say is stay the course. But by staying the course, that assumes that you have structured a strategic portfolio that gives you exposure to different kinds of assets in a diversified way that you're able to um, hold on to those positions through market cycles, through changes in interest rates, through changes in inflation, through maybe a financial crisis, right? And again, the decision that you're making is at a policy level and you're doing the best you can to kind of say, well, you know, what's the likelihood of 2008 happening again? What's the likelihood of 2001 happening again? What if a 1987 happens again, right? Which one of those is too much for you to bear risk? And does your current portfolio reflect the ability for you as an organization to withstand that kind of a downturn? Now, now again, you have to balance that though, because even though I said, hey, focus more on the downside, you wanna capture that upside. So if you're only focusing all the time on like, hey, I wanna avoid all these risks, well, you gotta have some risk. You have to have some ability to generate positive returns. So, you know, a year ago, nobody knew that the S&P 500 was gonna be driven by these magnificent seven stocks and that the markets would be near record levels right now. Everyone thought we'd be in a recession right now. So guess what? Everybody was pretty much wrong, you know? Um, so as a, as a trustee, you wanna be able to capture as much of the upside, but mitigate that downside in case things go wrong. So it's a, it's a portfolio, thinking, it's strategic thinking, and it's long-term thinking. And we all have to acknowledge, we just don't know where the markets are going to be next year, a year from now, five years from now. We have a good idea that probably stocks are going to continue to grow the way they have the last hundred years for the next hundred years. So you want to have that exposure, but we don't know for sure. And we don't know in what, what time periods in the next hundred years are stocks going to be down 30% or 20%, right? And if you've built a portfolio as an institution that wants to be on for the long term, hopefully you have strategies and you have approaches in the portfolio that will allow you to weather those down markets. And as an institution, you can do that much better than an individual, right? As an individual, I can't be down 30%. I'm going to miss my mortgage or what, something like that. But as an institution, investing for the long term, you should be able to um, withstand that. Again, that's one of the strengths of being in a, a long-term investor, an institution like you are. Can you uh, mention then the, the mixture of like uh, tech stocks and so on? Are you able as a trustee to include tech stocks? Um, so you do participate in it. For sure you participated in the, in the State Street Index Fund that you're invested with because they own all the stocks in the S&P 500. So that's one way. Some of the other strategies will also have exposure to those tech stocks. Um, so you do participate in it. 
Um, but I'll just recall, um, as I said the first time I was in front of you, is that my strength is not going to be able to tell you what stocks to invest or not invest in, right? I'm trying to um, give you advice in terms of structure, in terms of long-term investing, and that's where I can add value. Um, but I, I would say, even though, hey, those stocks have run up a lot, and maybe people are trimming some of those positions, which isn't, isn't a bad thing to do, but I don't know where they'll go. They may continue to go up. Some people are saying these guys, these big stocks can continue to go up. Um, but hopefully you have other strategies in there that expose you to other things. So if suddenly this year, those stocks aren't up 43% like they were last year, but they're maybe up 10% or down 5%, um, other parts of your portfolio will generate the returns that allow you to continue to fund your activities and to grow into the future. And that's the advantage of having a diversified portfolio, which you do have and which I recommend you continue to have, even if the structure or the governance changes. Trustee Ahuna. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my question is to the overall structure. Uh, you, you talked about upside, downside with managers. I want, I'm worried about managers. Well, what's the difference between an active manager and just uh, what's going on with, with like a regular manager? So um, generally, um, so if we're talking about, um, uh, I, I guess one to start out with, I would just say like all managers are active in some way, even if they were a passive manager, because not making a decision to invest in something or investing a certain way is kind of a decision. But the, the, the general um, description, and let's just stay with the liquid market. So let's stick with the markets where um, securities trade on an exchange like stocks. Um, the difference between an active manager and a passive manager would be that um, an active manager is saying, I have a skill in investing. Remember um, at the first meeting, I talked about four different ways of generating excess return, right? You got better information, you interpret information better, you got better execution or you got better risk management. So what a, an active manager is generally saying is I've got a strategy and I do something because it takes skill to generate returns, excess returns beyond the S&P 500, let's say, as your index. And so I'm going to get paid a little more for that and I'm going to generate returns that you can't achieve without my skill. A passive manager will say, I'm just going to give you exposure to the market. I'm going to give you like your, your state street strategy. I'm just going to give you exposure to the S&P 500, and I'm going to match that S&P 500, no matter if stocks are going up, no matter if stocks are going down. And so over time, you're going to generate the return of having exposure to those stocks. But I'm not doing anything special. I don't have a better model. I'm not trying to interpret information. I'm just making sure you have that exposure over time. And so they charge a lower fee because they're not saying they have some special skill. They're just saying, I have the ability to give you exposure to the market generally. And actually one of our, our speakers um, uses that strategy a lot in, in, um, in their portfolio. And yeah. we'll hear from them directly. Okay, no, just a quick follow-up question because you know, for me, sometimes paying a little bit more, we, we get better results. So when you talk about managers, uh, you know, the return and stuff like that. Um, sometimes I, I feel like the active managers, they get the most out of it, you know. So um, even though we're paying a little bit more, sometimes it, it can still be a better thing. Yes, um, I, I'm sort of agnostic. It really depends if they can show, demonstrate their ability to generate those returns okay. over time. And as long as they do that, then if that's a fair um, price, uh, meaning, you know, it's competitive with other, what other managers with that skill set are charging, then yeah, that could, that could actually be a good thing to have in the portfolio. Okay, then um, chair and trustees, if, it, if it's okay, I'd like to invite our um, CIO, CIO panel to, uh, to be given um, uh, a microphone. And I think, I hope they're all there. This is on page 12 of the presentation. You'll see a short description we have three um, really very qualified and very well respective, um, respected investors. Um, you'll see um, Steve Edmondson there on the left. Uh, well, I don't know if you if everyone's screen is the same, but um, Steve is with the, the Nevada Public Employees Retirement System. And there's a short description there. I'm going to give him a chance to introduce himself. 
Um, and Steve um, has a, a portfolio that is sort of very famous in the um, institutional world in terms of how they manage it. And so we'll talk a little bit about passive and active with him. Um, Mr. Rodney June is uh, with the Lacers logo there. Um, Rod is um, a former uh, chief investment officer for the state of Hawaii pension plan, the ERS. Um, and he is the current um, chief investment officer for the Los Angeles um, um, city uh, employees retirement system. And um, he has, um, he actually um, has family from Hawaii and he is sometimes um, back in the islands every now and then, but he also knows uh, how we manage money here in the islands, but he is um, a, a very well-regarded um, chief investment officer. And I should mention he, he was my, uh, my former boss. I learned a lot about institutional investing from Rod. So the full disclosure there, Rod, I hope you don't mind. Um, and then the, the final person is actually uh, Kwan Yuan, who is the former chief investment officer of the uh, Hawaii EUTF. So if you remember last time, we heard from one of the trustees from EUTF, who was um, Kwan's boss um, um, in, in that sense. And, and Kwan was hired as an uh, investment officer. And then as the portfolio grew and his responsibilities grew, they actually made him a chief investment officer. So we'll hear a little bit about how that, that grew. So um, thank you, um, all three of you, for joining us. I appreciate it. I, I know that uh, Steve and Rod, you're kind of out there in the West, and, and, and Quan is actually um, locally based here. So um, let me uh, begin. Uh, I'm going to moderate this panel, and I'll begin by asking questions. I'm just going to ask uh, generally of all three panelists. Um, so uh, the trustees have a short description in terms of your background and your organization, but could you share a little bit more about your um, kind of career trajectory and maybe um, in particular, um, are there, were there any lessons or jobs that you held that helped you be prepared to be an, uh, um, an institutional investor? And um, Steve, since you're the, the furthest away, why don't we start with you and then we'll go over to Quan and then Rod. Yeah, thank you, Vijoy. Um, hello, hi, everybody. Uh, great to see you, Vijoy. Rod. I think we can't well. hear Steve yet. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can we make... Sorry, um, Dave, can you please make Office of Hawaiian Affairs a co-host so we can enable audio? Co-host is enabled. Could anybody else who is on the Zoom try to speak so we can see if we can hear you in here? Testing one, two, three from Lacers. This is Steve from Nevada. Jerry Flintoff with Consequent. <laughs> I could hear all those. This is Dave from IT. Steve, do you want to say something? See if we can hear you. Sure. Yeah. Hi, be Joy. Rod. There Good you go, Steve. Hey, thank, thanks for being here. If, if, if you want to uh, launch into it, that'd be great. 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 Well, thanks for uh, inviting me to join today. Um, just a quick introduction. My name is Steve Edmondson. I'm the, the CIO here at Nevada PERS. We're a, uh, as of today, right around $61 billion uh, um, public DV plan here in the state of Nevada. We cover all of the uh, public employees within the state. Um, so whether you're a state employee or a city or a county or a school district employee, you're a participant in Nevada PERS. Um, I've been here at, at, at PERS since 2005. Uh, so going on 19 years here at, at the retirement system, I came from the private sector um, uh, originally. Um, 
uh, working in uh, corporate treasury, moved over here to uh, the retirement system originally. Um, I was actually, there was three people here at the time. I was originally hired on as an analyst, was quickly kind of promoted up to the deputy investment officer job. And then um, in 2012, I became uh, the CIO here at Nevada Per. So I've been doing it here for um, for a while now. And, uh, you know, in terms of things that 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 have helped me along the way in my, in, in my career, um, I would say first and foremost, I've, j I've just had the, the, the luck and privilege of being able to work with some fantastic people, um, both prior to uh, working here at Nevada Purs that mentored me along the way through my finance career um, in the private sector and then coming over here. Um, I had a couple of terrific mentors um, that kind of, uh, I, I worked up through uh, the process of becoming CIO and the previous CIO here, who I'm still good friends with, um, was a terrific mentor as well. Because when you work in the, in the public domain, like, um, you know, we're operating here. I believe this is a public board meeting. Um, it, it, it it creates a a, a unique, or I guess it would re it requires a unique skill set, and they you have to be able to operate both. Um, you know, put together an investment portfolio that will work over time, but also operate in 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 a very public and visible way, um, and being able to manage through um, um, some difficult times in while you're in the spotlight. And so it requires some PR skills along the way too. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, Rod, Rod, same question, background, and then what were the, a couple, maybe something that uh, influenced you or hit, made you into the CIO you are? Okay, very good, V. Joy, and uh, good afternoon, uh, OHA trustees. Thank you for having me here today. It's sort of good to be back on the island, even though physically I'm here in California, but as V. Joy said, I do get back to the islands um, quite often because uh, I have a lot of family uh, in Honolulu and uh, around Oahu. Um, I started off, uh, you know, really working for the city of L.A. I'll, I'll kind of start there. I've had jobs prior to that, and I won't go into too much detail, but started my career with the city of Los Angeles out of graduate school uh, back in 1990 and worked in affordable housing programs uh, that were HUD funded and I gained a lot of experience on the administrative side, but I was also a project manager that helped uh, develop multifamily affordable housing in the city of Los Angeles. And working with politicians and community development banks and a lot of different leaders in the city, I think gave me a very good grounding for moving forward into a position like uh, the chief investment officer uh, I, I was uh, an employee of a bank. I was a lending officer at one time. I was also a substitute teacher, uh, believe it or not, and a management consultant. And so the variety of experiences that I gained from varied positions, but also working as a management consultant in different kinds of businesses um, helped me understand um, how businesses can add value over time. And that's exactly what we do as in a public pension plan or what you're doing at OHA is to add value, to uh, increase the corpus of your portfolio uh, and to make money in a very prudent and um, smart way. So um, that's sort of sort of my trajectory. Uh, I worked at Lacer starting in 1998 and uh, I had the good fortune of working in all of the asset classes, because at the time we were about a $7 billion plan, uh, I was able to sort of work across uh, public equities, non-US equities, real estate, uh, and private equity. And that gave me a good foundation to, to eventually become a CIO. Uh, I was a head of private equity for the plan uh, just prior to going over to Hawaii in 2008 to be, become the CIO for the ERS. And... It, I wouldn't say it was so much my private equity background as it was probably more my varied background in a number of asset classes. Um, and I think that that helped quite a bit. Um, and then was at Hawaii for almost five years. And then my boss back at Los Angeles City Employees retired and his position opened up and I thought it would be a good time to, to get back to California um, and, and get that position. So... I've been at Lacers as CIO for about a little over 11 years now, and uh, it's been a very good um, 
very good ride for me. I think working in Hawaii for a multi-employer retirement system and with Lacers as the CIO, where we handle just the civilian employees of the city of LA. We, we uh, do not have the fire and police. They have their own plan and the utility workers have their own plan. Uh, so anyway, that that's where I'm at today, but I think it's just all the varied experiences that I've had in, in various jobs. Um, I think all contributed to helping me to become a, an effective CIO. And uh, I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. And then Quan, uh, same question. And, and I'll note that um, while you've left EUTF as uh, the CIO, you're now running a family business here in the islands. Um, so Quan. Thanks, um, Aloha, trustee, staff, visual, and fellow panelists. Great to be with you this afternoon. Um, my name is Kwan Yuan. As, as Vijo shared, I, I spent some time at the uh, Hawaii ETF. Um, and to to you know, I'll go back a little bit from the beginning of my my career. I think those uh, every step had a some influence and and making me a sort of uh, you know that, that prepared me for the CIO role. So I my first career my first job was an auto mechanic. Actually, uh, my family valued education, but just didn't have the resource to uh, help me pay for one. Uh, but I was really fortunate that I came across an entrepreneurial opportunity and I got to run a small automotive uh, service and distribution company for about four years. I successfully grew that and that's what paid for college. So I attended HPU and study management. And after HPU, I had a chance to join world, uh, one of the world's largest tire uh, manufacturer but uh, around that time, I realized I was really missing an important tool. I didn't have a working knowledge of finance, and I didn't study that in, in, in college, um, you know, to my fault, right? Uh, so I decided to you know, try and fix that. So instead, I joined Bank of Hawaii. I joined the trust department to really try to learn finance uh, on the job. I did that. And... Being in the trust department, it also um, you know, we dealt with investment. So it actually helped me not only learn finance, but build a foundation, uh, investing foundation. So my role at Bank of Hawaii has really evolved over time, but it involved three hats. I was wearing three hats for, for most of that. So on one hand, I was uh, managing investments. So the, these are high net worth clients or small institutions. So think about you know, the smaller companies or, or institutions with uh, 10 million assets or less. And on the other hand, I was the other hat I was wearing was operations management. Somehow, you know, in, in the investment side, when there are operations involved, I get kind of pulled in to, to oversee or manage that. And then the third hat I was wearing was uh, in more strategic planning, you know, trying to think about ways to manage and grow revenue for the division. And, and so the latter two, although it wasn't really directly part of, uh, you know, day-to-day -day job, I think maybe because of my earlier involvement with, with small business, with business, uh, growing business, you know, kind of naturally pulled me into those roles. Um, fast forward uh, 2016, I was approached uh, about the opportunity at U UTF. And it sounds like you know the, the board may uh, have heard a little bit about the history there. Basically, it's you know the, the organization was coming into a lot of money in a short period of time, and the amount of assets was going to grow at a very steep trajectory. And the investments up to that point, there was no dedicated investment staff, and so they needed to you know pipe, bring on staff, build out an investment office. So I'm thinking, given my experience wearing multiple hats. Uh, that seemed to be a good fit because they needed someone that um, has the investment foundation, but also you know readily and willingly to get involved on the operational side, build out the operation side, but also think strategically and how to um, you know grow the portfolio and uh, investment office over time. So I joined that uh, as I joined that organization as an investment officer. Uh, and about four and a half years later, I was uh, promoted into uh, chief investment officer. And I think the original idea was you, know, you come in as an officer, if you're successful in growing, growing that portfolio, growing the investment office, then I will have a shot at the investment officer position, at the chief investment officer position, which you know, I was fortunate uh, to, to have been uh, you know, promoted into that role. Uh, you know, I am the past, the former, uh, so that means I, I am no longer with the organization. So this past uh, September, September last year, 
um, after a great seven year run, you, you know, felt that portfolio was in a great place, performance was strong and had great prospects ahead and was ready for really the next uh, generation of leadership. So a uh, step aside, my wife and I founded Blue Tie where we're buying and operating small, medium-sized businesses from retiring owners that don't have a succession plan. So, you know, that's really, in a nutshell, my uh, um, you know, professional uh, history and led up to UTF and, 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 and today. I'll take a pause there. Thank you. Th thank you, Quan. That that's terrific. Um, okay, so the the um, the trustees here have been hearing about governance and fiduciary responsibilities, and you know, kind of how to manage uh, institutional uh, portfolio as such. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, this is to everyone um, your your work with a board and with staff in terms of reaching the mission of the organization. And and maybe I'll go to uh, to Rod first, and then Quan, and then Steve. But if you could talk a little bit about how you work with um, trustees, staff, stakeholders, um, just give us a one or two ways that you think is um, effective. Yes, um, sure. I'll be happy to start. You know, working with boards um, as a CIO, it's primarily uh, through board meetings because we are a public entity. Uh, the work that I do, how I transmit information to them, and recommendations is all through that sort of governance structure, which is through um, through the meeting process. I will say to be most effective with the board, I, I rely heavily on the governance structure, which is really looking back at the policies, having a, a strong grounding in uh, understanding policies, how to implement the policy, uh, and to ensure that uh, we are in compliance with policy because the policy um, is really designed to assure that you can achieve your financial goals in the best way possible. Um, you have the highest likelihood of, of doing so. Uh, so I would say really, um, I would say mine's probably more governance oriented. It, it wasn't always that way. I think I, when I first became CIO, I, I probably ran the program more off the seat of my pants but I've learned over time that uh, the governance structure really is how it really addresses how you achieve performance and how you minimize the risk in doing so. And it is, um, I think, the best path to take. Um, I know there's an inclination for trustees and even staff to want to do things that are maybe more tactical less strategic, but your policy framework really is more of a strategic approach. And a lot of thought and care um, is generally put into the design and crafting of language of policy. It really, um, I think, incorporates the institutional, institutional mindset of the organization. And so when I'm executing on implementation of any type of investment, um, I always go back and look at the policy and ensure that I conform with it and I stay within those bounds. Um, and when trustees have questions about, well, can't we do this or can't we do that or should we do this? It usually goes back to, let me, if I don't know what the policy is at the time, I would usually say, Give me a chance to look at the policy and see if it addresses that uh, particular idea that you have. And if it doesn't, and if it seems like a good idea, then we can always go back and amend the policy. Um, that requires a lot of deliberation, a lot of um, consultation with consultants, staff, um, other experts to, to make sure you get it right, because those policies need to endure over the long period of time, you know, not just three or five years, but policies are usually good for 10 years or, or in, into perpetuity. So um, I would just to kind of summarize that my approach working with boards is really uh, shaped by the governance structure um, of our plan. Thank you, Rod. Um, Steve, same question. Um, so as it relates to um, working with, uh, with the board and having an effective board. Yeah, thanks, Bjoy. Um, I would say that my my experience at, uh, working with the board is is somewhat similar to what Rod had just described. 
we're both public entities. And so we, you know, we, we largely interact um, and are required to interact through these public board meetings. Um, but in terms of, I guess if I was going to add something to that, specifically here in Nevada, one of the things that I've found is really important um, is that everybody here in Nevada, and I think it's something that we've done uh, particularly well uh, between staff, board, and our constituents, meaning our members and beneficiaries, the teachers and the, and the firefighters and the employer, employers uh, that participate in, in, in Nevada's uh, pension plan, is that we are all very much in agreement of what our overall mission is. We're here to uh, fund a public pension plan. Um, you know, everybody take, puts on the, their fiduciary hat. They, they, they drop aside whatever other interests they, they might be uh, representing. And we all represent the, the, the singular in, uh, interest here in Nevada when dealing with uh, uh, the pensions affairs. And that's ultimately to, to fund the retirement benefits of our members and beneficiaries. In addition to that, what I think we've done particularly well is to build a culture um, that in an investment portfolio that reflects the broader culture um, of, of our organization here in Nevada. Um, and it's kind of getting to, 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 to some of the stuff that Vijoy was talking about earlier in his presentation, which I, you know, I thought was, was fantastic in that, um, you know, we really have to craft an investment portfolio that um, can withstand those deep spots in the stream. Can can you can get through the the, the, the difficult moments, and a large part of that is is creating a portfolio that fits well with the culture of both our governance structure and with our constituents. And that's one of the reasons why our portfolio is kind of simply designed with a heavy, heavy influence on indexing. Um, is that that is something that has resonated with our members and beneficiaries. It's resonated with our governance structure. And so inevitably there's going to be, it's sort of like pick your poison, you know, decide, you know, you know, which problems you, you want to have and which problems you can withstand and then build a, a, um, a portfolio that that's kind of designed to get you through those spots. And I think that our governance structure and working with the board in that capacity um, has, has ultimately allowed us to do that. Thank, thank you, Steve. Juan, working with uh, with board, and we did hear from uh, Christian Fern last time, so I know that uh, you work closely with Christian as he was a trustee head of the investment committee. You want right, to add right. some comments to what Rod and Steve have said? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, no, first of all, uh, and really a lot of similarities with what Rod and Steve have said. And you know, first of all, I think, and I personally have a high degree of respect for for trustees and you know. The, the responsibilities that you're taking in you're wearing multiple hats many hats right you're uh representing your constituents and you know in this role in the fiduciary responsibility to the organization and you know it, it, there it's a balancing act with, of many forces that are involved so you know really respect that uh that the roles you're in in the case of uh utf specifically uh you know the, i think the key underpinning is that was a high degree of trust that was built up over time between staff and and the board, and so I think that really enabled um, you know, the the governance and, and the execution to all work uh, very smoothly. Uh, it, it took many years to really I think build up that trust, um, but you know that kind of like what what Ra was sharing with the structure where the board really uh, focused on the strategic level. Um, I'm monitoring and overseeing and, uh, you know, staff comes in and to, to do, to execute and implement. And we were actually in the early stages of, uh, of, uh, you know, start to take on some delegation of decision and it, which you know, that takes uh, time itself. But again, you know, all the, I think I will point to trust being really the key underpinning in the overall governance structure that makes things uh, happen and happen smoothly. Okay, thank you, Quan. I'm gonna now just ask an um, uh, individual question of each panelist to round out the portfolio. Um, so if I could go to um, Steve first. And um, Steve, you had mentioned that um, the portfolio you've built, the way you manage it sort of reflects the culture of the organization and the people that you work with. And I know one thing that the Nevada program has been known for in the past is sort of having a, a heavy dose of passive 
strategies in the portfolio. So I wonder if you could um, help the trustees understand that approach and why it was so meaningful um, to the Nevada plan. Great, sure, Vijoy. Um, yeah, so Nevada uh, is 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 developed a reputation in the industry um, for being the kind of the simple plan out there. Uh, we have fewer moving parts. We have a tiny investment staff for a sixty billion dollar uh, investment portfolio. It's myself and one other person now. Up until uh, uh, two thousand and twenty two, it was just myself for a number of years as a singular investment employee, um, and this this emphasis that we've placed on indexing um, largely derives from the way that we manage the fund very much from a top-down level. We manage asset allocation. And indexing is an absolutely fabulous tool um, for the way that we manage the fund from that top-down asset allocation focus level in that we can put the exact market exposures into the fund that we want. So let's say we want to own U.S. stocks, we can index to S&P 500. Um, and so we can put that pie slice in the exact way that we want it into the portfolio. And we can do it in a really efficient and low cost way. Um, one of the benefits to indexing is that it keeps your fees low. Um, and that's something, and that's getting to the, to, to the culture here. Um, that's something that's resonated with our constituents over the years. Um, if, you, if you're invested in say uh, uh, an active equity portfolio, it might cost you 45 basis points relative to indexing that might cost you a basis point. And so, you know, starting from that low fee structure to begin with, that's something that's resonated culturally with our members and, and, and beneficiaries. They very much understand owning uh, large cap blue chip socks. They know that when they go up, um, we'll participate. They also understand that when they go down, that we'll participate in the downside as well. And this is something that, that they know and expect. Um, and it's easily explainable. Um, keeping fees low in a public environment is always beneficial. Um, and the reality is from an investment standpoint, um, lower fees, uh, you know, when you have a high fee structure in an investment portfolio, uh, there was a discussion earlier today on, on, on this call about, well, sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it's worth it. Absolutely. Um, but the key thing is, is 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 whether or not you can kind of stick through those tough times with those expensive investment portfolios is if you're paying managers a whole bunch of money and you go through a three or five year period down cycle and you're not able to stick with it then inevitably you kind of make the emotional mistake of of, of getting rid of whatever that that strategy was at the wrong time and and indexing is a, is a good way for us to avoid those kind of emotional mistakes within the portfolio i would say you know some of the maybe the downsides to the way that we do it is that you know one of them is simply that we look different than everybody else. Um, when you construct an investment portfolio that is different, you kind of stick your neck out there a little bit. Um, our portfolio is going to behave differently than than our peer group um, across market cycles, and we're prepared for that. Uh, so we spend a lot of time around managing expectations. When will we look good? When will we look bad? Everybody understands that, and that's getting to to to, to the earlier discussion about working with our board and our governance structure. And I think that we've been able to do that since we've been doing it for a long time now, everybody knows what to expect with our portfolio um, in any given market environment. And, and again, it's just kind of pick your poison. And, 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 and the one that we've picked is, is, is kind of the low fee structure. We understand uh, um, what the portfolio will do in specific environments. We don't uh, pretend that we can avoid uh, downside volatility in, 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 in various markets. And we understand that and we're able to live through those those tough times as a result. And, you know, I would say at the end of the day, that's probably the most important thing is to be able to, to pick an approach and stick with it. Because if you abandon it at the wrong time, then inevitably that, that, that will ultimately hurt returns more than anything else. Thank, thank you, Steve. That's, that's great. Very insightful. Um, Rod, in your case, even though you worked in um, all the major asset classes through your career, I think it's fair to say that even in the 2000s, um, you were pioneering in terms of public plans and institutional investors in investing in um, alternatives and private equity in particular, um, even though you, know, you saw that in the endowments 
and even Washington um, State uh, had was an early adopter, but a lot of plans hadn't gone in that direction. And I think um, with your background, you were a proponent of using alternatives and building diverse diverse portfolios. So maybe in contrast to what Steve just described, um, can you give us some insights in terms of your thinking of building a portfolio the way you did? Yeah, certainly. Um, I would like to at least uh, talk um, just a few seconds on the active versus passive. So we have a combination of both at Lacers. Uh, we are passively invested in U.S. large cap, which is a very efficient asset class. Uh, but many of the other, other asset classes like small cap U.S. equities, emerging market equities, for example, where there's more inefficiency, um, our board believes that we can add value to that area through active management if we can choose the right managers. And I could talk you know, for minutes on that, but uh, we do have a combination of both. We have been in private equity at Lacers since 1996. So we have um, what I'd say a fairly uh, long runway of, of being in the asset class. We have a fairly mature portfolio. We've allocated close close to or slightly over $5 billion to that asset class over the last uh, 25 years. Uh, it is our best performing asset class, but it is also the riskiest asset class, meaning uh, Vijoy had spoken earlier about volatility. Uh, in order to get those types of returns, you have to subject yourself to volatility. Um, it is a bet if you will, that our board is willing to take. It's also an essential asset class, meaning that our assumed rate of return at our retirement system is 7%. In order to achieve that 7% bogey over long periods of time, we really have no choice but to search out higher performing asset classes that yes, does carry greater risk and yes, carries much higher fees, but without being in those asset classes, we would fall short in ever reaching close to 7%, uh, which is our assumed rate of return. So we are in that asset class. Uh, we are, we try to diversify. We don't time the market, meaning that intuitively one can say, you know, this is a good time to be in private equity. The markets are robust, interest rates are low. And there's times when you want, might say, no, we shouldn't be there. But we try to take a very uh, even kill, balanced, um, and consistent approach to private equity, meaning that we, we tend to allocate the same amount of dollars from year to year. There is a plan behind that, and that's called our annual strategic plan, which we review with our board every year. And we get them to understand what the next 12 months will look like. They approve that plan and then staff executes on that plan. For private equity, that is the one asset class plus another asset class, private credit, where the board has delegated uh, decision-making authority to the consultant and staff, which means that every time we make a commitment to a fund investment in private equity, and our fund investments are generally 20 to $75 million per commitment. We do not need to go and get board approval in advance. They have established a policy framework that has all the guardrails and risk parameters in it. And we follow that and we make the commitment. And then we notify our board after we've made the commitment and assure them uh, that we have followed the policy that they had approved uh, for executing on private equity. Um, again, it's our highest performing asset class, but it does carry risk. That's true with any asset class. The greater return that you expect to get from it, the greater volatility or fluctuations you can expect to have. But when you combine private equity with other asset classes, your overall risk is reduced down. And that's the term that we, we use, diversification. We try to diversify um, as much risk away as we can by building around different asset classes. And we have a highly diversified portfolio at Lacers. So I'm going to pause there. Thank you, Rod. Also, a lot of great insights there and things I think we'll come back to discuss. 
Um, Quan, you talked a little bit already about your um, your journey at UTF and how the position evolved, but I was wondering if you could maybe focus in on how you went from a, a zero AUM portfolio to a $6 billion portfolio in terms of the kinds of resources that you needed or the kinds of support um, that you provided or were provided by the different um, you know, leaders in the EUTF, including trustees, including executive directors. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, the resource needs of going from a zero portfolio to 6 billion? Sure, sure. Uh you know, kind of to set the stage, coming into the the role, really it was there was a consultant that was already involved, and that consultant was previously working with the administrator of the fund to manage the day to day. Uh, and at that time, the portfolio looked something like you know about maybe four or five asset classes, and each of those asset class was probably like a mutual fund or some publicly traded uh, vehicle. Now at that time, what right when I uh, stepped in, the the consultant already worked with the board to, um, you know, decide what the long term picture was going to look like, and that involved somewhere I think in the twelve or thirteen asset classes. So most of the things that needed to be there that the board wanted to be there it is not there yet, and so, you know, from that standpoint is figure out well what. First of all, how do we prioritize amongst these different asset classes that we need to have this fully functioning portfolio? And, and what that is is you know, going back to the to Vijay's presentation earlier. Um, you know, he talked about you know downside risk and tail risk and these different type of you know ways of thinking uh, and how do you generate strong returns, but also you want to pr prevent losses when times are not there. So those are what the different parts of the, um, the, the, the additional asset classes we're trying to add in, including alternatives like, like private equity. And so how we, you know, how we ended up doing, uh, it, how we ended up tackling the problem was, you know, kind of, you know, we took a blend of passive and active approach where, enforce basically any liquid assets, any liquid investments, we just make that passive. And we know over the long run, bang for the buck is probably going to be on the alternatives on the private market side. So let's get exposure first, get us the beta that we need, and then uh, start building out the private markets gradually. So as we were going through that, you know, the, the we were using, we we're at first using the same set of consultants. The same was, we basically went to one consultant that provided us all different types of help. And if that really worked, and you know, we give them credit, you know, kudos to them, they give us really good sound advice at the beginning. And as we start to evolve and, you know, we, we develop better feel for specific needs in different parts of the, the portfolio. So from a consultant standpoint, you know, we thought you know, we need to reassess who are the different providers and what are the different strengths. So a couple of years down the road, we ended up bringing in other consultants for specific parts of the portfolio. And so that you know, that's how the, the consultant side evolved. Staffing, you know, as a public entity, I'm sure we all face the same challenge of, you know, we've got to go through the legislative process to request positions, and it takes years uh, for that to happen. So it took about three years for us to get our second staff. I was the first. It took three years for us to get our first analyst, and then took probably another year or two for the next position. So we knew that that was going to be a long process to staff up. And so... You know, that also impacted how we thought about our working relations with consultant is where can we make the model where it's flexible, where we can lean on them in, in, in for, for tasks or for roles that, you know, we cannot uh, effectively or quickly staff up, but remain in control of more strategic um, decisions or, or strategic relationships. And as we ramp up staffing, we can, you know, maybe take some of those responsibilities back from consultant. So that's like, you know, kind of, I jumped around a hit a couple of things, but, you know, kind of looking at it, you know, overall is, you know, staff's, uh, staff's involvement grew as the team grew 
and a consultant's role changed over time as our, our team got, got, uh, got right-sized. I'll take a pause there and see if uh, it, that was helpful. I can have it. Okay, th thank you, Quan. Um, if, if any of the panels have any more comments, happy to take that. But also, trustees, if you'd like to ask any questions of the panelists or myself, um, happy to entertain that at this time. Otherwise, um, we'll conclude our presentation. Trustee Lindsay. I just wondered at what, at what point in time since you have started with us, would you be able to share this, the condition of our policies? So, so what I'd like to do is at the next um, RMC meeting um, later this month is to share our observations and then to bring to the trustees on March 6th, the next following um, RMC meeting recommendations on those observations in terms of policy changes. So that would probably consist of a memo as well as potentially a red line version if that's um, acceptable in terms of how the, the board goes about doing what they need to do. And then I think that that point, um, the process of where the trustees would evaluate and recommend would probably happen at the next meeting. So after the, the common fund event, that, that's sort of the timing we're expecting. Thank you. Okay, uh, trustees, thank you very much uh, for your time and for your attention here. Um, thank you to our three guest speakers who did a fabulous job. And, and I know that your time's very valuable as well. So appreciate you making, um, making time for us this afternoon and, and providing very insightful um, thoughts on how you um, do your job as an investor. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, guys. we want to thank welcome. you. Aloha. Aloha for the opportunity. Aloha. Aloha. It was so good to see two local guys. <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you, Vijay, again. Um, with that, we have we do have one more thing. Wait. Um, so we do have a, a update on the wildfire aid response, and I will turn us over to our Pohana, um, Stacy. Mahalo Nui, Chair. Trustees, you should have a copy of the presentation in front of you. And if I could ask for the presentation up on the screen. So I was asked to assist Chair Hulu Lindsay in putting together a proposal for the board. And this is more information sharing um, at this point to get feedback from trustees. And so I wanted to um, share with you what we've um, put together. And if we go to the next slide. So back in August when the wildfires occurred, uh, the trustees made a bold commitment of $5 million um, towards the recovery efforts in Maui, not necessarily just Lahaina, but also those that were suffering um, uh, losses in Kula as well. And so on our website, if you go to oha.org, you'll see um, a statement um, from our board on September 6th committing to our Native Hawaiian families impacted by the 2023 Maui wildfires, the $5 million in aid um, for disaster recovery. Next slide. However, that wasn't the only aid that was provided to our Maui uh, beneficiaries. Uh, as you can see on this slide, the $5 million commitment is by far the largest, but I do want to also point out that um, the trustees made other commitments to our beneficiaries. One was helping with the um, economic development data gathering to really assess um, how Native Hawaiian businesses were being affected by uh, the wildfire tragedy. We've also been um, very involved in natural and cultural resource advocacy and consultation. Uh, our compliance team, Kai Markel and Kamakana Ferreira, have been essential in providing feedback on Olowalu and other um, coastal studies that are being done now with runoff um, as the rains have, have um, 
hit the Lahaina uh, community and um, ensuring that again, the county and other governmental agencies are in compliance um, with, with um, state, county and federal laws and certainly ensuring that our beneficiary Native Hawaiian rights are being monitored and followed. Um, we also provided resources um, at Hakuane. We um, did offer up warehousing space um, for Maui relief donations that has just recently come to an end, but was critical um, when we had just thousands of individuals wanting to pro uh, provide extra care and support in all kinds of ways, whether it was food or clothing to our um, Maui brothers and sisters. Uh, we also, provided sponsorship to the Viva Ole Maui Benefit Concert that also raised funds for the Maui community. And then just recently, we provided sponsorship to the Lele Aloha March held in Lahaina in January, where we had um, Trustee Ohuna um, representing our board um, in Lahaina for that effort. So again, you know, uh, the board has been very active uh, since August in many different ways, but the $5 million, um, is kind of top of mind, I think, for the board. And, and I know that many of you have been getting calls or emails or folks stopping by to um, kind of pick your brain on what's that next step. So we want to share with you what our, our thinking is. Before I get into the proposal, I just want to leave you with some data, some data points that I think um, will help to inform uh, the proposal. So the 2020 U.S. Census, um, they estimated about 2,009 90 Native Hawaiians or about 360 Native Hawaiian families that were resided in the impacted area. And this is specifically to Lahaina. So this doesn't include our, our Kula um, Ohana. Um, owner occupied housing units um, from 2018 to 2022 was about 51.8%. And the median value of an owner occupied housing unit um, in 2018 through 2022 was about 800,000. Um, and I'm sure that's attributed much to the um, the tourism you know, factor in Lahaina. Um, it's also important to note that the median selected uh, monthly owner cost with a mortgage is about $2,800 and uh, median selected monthly owner cost without a mortgage is about 471. So I just wanna baseline our understanding around what that means in terms of owner costs or monthly owner cost. So that includes things like utilities, HOA, property taxes, homeowners insurance, and ongoing home maintenance. So just uh, some additional information. Um, the White House just released a fact sheet um, today, this morning, um, six months after the fire. So they recapped, FEMA recapped um, what they've done um, in Maui. And so six months since the fire, FEMA has put $330 million in loans and grants towards the response and recovery efforts. Um, they've also provided 43.7 million in assistance to 7,000 households. So why I mentioned this uh, FEMA uh, data for you is because it's really important to know that right now there is extreme, there's an extreme priority to move folks out of hotels into long-term housing. And the reason for that is FEMA's funding is intended to end in February, 2025. So that's coming pretty quickly. Um, so I've had the opportunity to um, participate in the, the Maui Economic Recovery Commission on behalf of OHA. And I know that um, both Chair and myself have had conversations with um, um, the Maui mayor and um, getting feedback um, from him and from the work that we've been you know, participating and, you know, this is Chair's Island. And um, so she's on the ground. She gets a lot of feedback, probably on the daily, on what needs to happen and what her constituents want. And so that's really helped to inform um, what we're gonna um, share with you now. Could we go to the next slide, please? Mahalo. So knowing that, um, you know, the FEMA funding is going to be ending, we do have folks transitioning out of these temporary shelters. Um, there is a, extreme need to get um, funding into our residents' hands so that they can make this transition into more longer term, more stable housing. Um, and we wanna make sure that their basic needs are being met. And so um, 
we don't want our beneficiaries to continue to have to jump through many hoops and and go to various different places to figure out how to get funding. And so we believe that OHA's funding is going to be um, very critical and getting it to them in a very direct and quick way at this point um, is um, is where we want to go. So what we're planning on doing is launching in April and running through December 2024. We want to be able to provide tier funding options to our beneficiaries in Maui um, affected by the fires. Category one would be $9,000, and this would go to homeowner households with homes destroyed or no longer accessible, as evidenced by a letter from the county or inclusion of the home on the damaged damage log maintained by the and issued by the uh, County Office of Housing. And then two is also located or located in the mandatory evacuation area as established and amended by the mayor of the County of Maui. And then the second category is $4,000 to renter households displaced from a home or rental unit destroyed or is no longer accessible as evidenced by a letter from the county or inclusion of the home or rental unit on the damage log maintained by the and issued by the County of the Office of Housing or located in the mandatory evacuation area as established and amended by the mayor of the county. So again, we're looking at two tiers of funding, one if you are a homeowner and two if you were a renter. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, before I go on, I do wanna let you know that um, our CFO Ramona Hink did a lot of investigation on the tax implications of giving these uh, awards directly to beneficiaries, because we do not want to, we do not want them to be penalized by getting any funding directly. And so, um, what we were able to get back was that there will be no tax implications, and that funding will be considered um, uh, emergency relief. Yeah. Okay. So, just so take, um, just go just ahead, Ramona. Context, just for details, um, there will be. Uh, OHA doesn't have to issue a 1099 um, to the recipient of a qualified disaster uh, payment. And the recipient's gross income shall not include any amount received as a qualified disaster relief payment. Mahalo okay. for that due diligence, Ramona. We appreciate that on behalf of our beneficiaries. All right, and this next slide is um, the process, and I'm not going to go too much into the weeds, but please know that this is a very high level um, overview of the process. I don't want to, you know, um, I don't want to bore you with, you know, there's, there's much more that's going to um, be entailed in terms of us delivering this. Um, but at a very high level, our Maui office will facilitate and manage the eligibility uh, verification process. Um, and awarding of the funds. So um, we're very grateful that we do have staff already on Maui that will um, be leading and with support from our Oahu um, office here. And we are looking at sending um, temp assistance um, for the duration of the time that we will be giving these direct awards from April till December. Um, also, it's important to note that um, we, we are gonna be utilizing a verified list provided by the County of Maui. So um, Chair and I will be working diligently to get that list prior to us starting any um, verification, um, any um, disbursements, processing and disbursements. So here you see, a, a, again, a very truncated eligibility requirement list. Um, we are looking at applicants um, that are at least 18 years of age and native Hawaiian, um, with Native Hawaiian ancestry. Um, there may be non-Hawaiian adults that may apply on behalf of a minor Hawaiian child living in the same household. So we do know that we have many Native Hawaiian children who are overrepresented in our foster, uh, foster care system. So this may be a case where we have legal guardians who will be um, receiving benefits on their behalf. The household must be in one of the impacted disaster districts or zones determined by the county officials. And a household may consist of a person living alone or multiple unrelated individuals or families living together. We know that Hawaii is a very expensive place. So many times residents had multi-generational um, multi families um, co-residing. Um, co okay, next slide, please. 
So there are other things that are currently in development um, as we prepare to um, go forward with this proposal, we will be working very closely with our communications department to ensure that we can get the word out to our, um, our beneficiaries who were affected by the fires. In one of our recent um, emergency um, response uh, commission meetings, they provided a slide in Ikalamai. I don't have that to share with you, but I will, I will um, share it in a, in a subsequent BOT meeting, but it was shocking to me at how many have moved to the continent already. And so I, I'd like to present that to you because I think it's really important to know that even though we don't have all of our residents here, um, you know, didn't stay in Maui or have not relocated to one of our other islands, that we have many that are now on the continent that also um, need our support. So we will be working with our communications department to make sure that we can get this message out as, as far and wide as possible. Um, we are putting together an implementation plan and I wanna thank our COO, Casey Brown, um, who assisted me in very quickly putting together this implementation plan because there is a lot of details. We, we wanna make sure that we're keeping good records, that we are collecting the required documentation and that we are again, um, going to be coordinating along with the county of Maui to ensure that the right benefit, you know, the right, the beneficiaries are getting um, the support that they need. Um, I do want to uh, just close here with saying that, you know, we do have a timeline right now of April through December. And as much as we'd like to believe that we will get out all of the money, the $5 million, that may not be the case. Um, and so we will reassess with the board. Um, at the end of the year to see how far we've come, what progress we've made, and if there's any additional next steps that are required. Chair, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Chair, Madam Chair, I can add some, may I add something real quick? Go right ahead, Casey. Paula, uh, just to add, and um, fresh off the presses, um, Kapohana, I want to also add that we, our April estimated date was to have our CRM, so our software in place so that we could, you know, leverage Salesforce software to do some of this intake evaluation, the information exchange. But we're also capable of going manual, meaning more of a paper process so that we can get things up running even sooner. So we can do that by the end of February. So if the trustees so choose to move forward with this proposal, we can stand up a manual process to get things moving even quicker. Mahalo. I just want to say that we have a, a part of the list, not the whole list. And, and that's what's holding us back from starting to qualify our people. But um, this, this proposal or plan came up from my going into the community and talking to the people that were displaced, um, the different hubs that we had in, in Maui, especially in Lahaina, several hubs, five or six of them, just lulling around, talking story with them. And they've kind of all complained that the monies that have been going to the nonprofits have not been funneling back into their hands. And, and you know, they need, they need, um, they need money. Uh, we're holding off to see how close it would come to when they showed a real need after we exhausted all the benefits of the state, the federal, and the county. And that was part of the advice from the mayor to us. So um, I think we're at that point where maybe we can offer this money to them because it's going to take a few years before they recover. And I believe they're needing, they're needing help now. So, Trustee Souza, all the chair. Um, thank you from uh, for the presentation, uh, Stacy. Um, I love the option. We're getting it directly to our people. Um, uh, Ramona, if you can confirm, I know there's more monies um, that were possibly available. The reason why I asked is because we don't know the real number just yet. I think they're still finding out yet, chair. Uh, of the residents our native Hawaiian and putting uh, together the list. So, I mean, I, I just want to know, I mean, if there's potentially other options, if we don't get the monies out or if we needed more money, um, 
I know there's a couple of uh, housing, uh, temporary housing options that I'd like to explore as well, uh, possibly invo involving, not possibly involving, they already committed, but FEMA, uh, the state of Hawaii, Hawaii Community Foundation, that was announced um, shucks, uh, about a couple of weeks ago anyway. Um, if you can be a part of maybe those efforts as well, uh, exploring the housing option, um, as well as uh, this option as well, uh, which I do support. So thank you. Ramona, can you confirm that there are other funds uh, possibly available because I know this was just a start for our board uh, uh, con to contribute to the efforts, uh, recovery efforts. So, okay, so currently um, we do have a large grant budget, so we can allocate some of the um, current budget in grants to, um, you know, reallocate it someplace else or repurpose it. So, that's one option. The second option is that um, we're kind of um, right up against our spending limit. So um, it's gonna be hard to access more budget, budget monies because we're up um, against our spending limit. And that also includes any kind of grant carryovers because we have to assess the carryover in light of our spending limit too. Yeah. So I think the best um, kind of option we have right now is um, to look to reallocating some of our grant budget. Uh, we just went through a re uh, realignment so I can recalculate what the spending limit is and, you know, our budgets just to see, you know, what the excess is. But the last time I looked at it right before we did the realignment was that we didn't have too much um, cushion, I guess. Okay. Thank you, Ramona, for the update. No, I, I definitely support this. And I, I guess we see as it goes along um, how fast we can get all these monies to our beneficiaries. So thank you so much. Mahalo. Chair. Um, Yep, go ahead. Whoever it was can go. Mahalo. Um, this question is from Ramona regarding uh, the spending limit that you mentioned. What were some of the top amounts that we recently um, allocated or distributed or planning to distribute that would affect the spending limit? So one of them was um, a reallocation. Well, we used our current budget and we reallocated certain funds, but then the big one was the $1 million um, government lo governance loan that we paid out in fiscal 24 that we had actually budgeted in fiscal 23. So that increased our budget by a million dollars right there. And then um, the, the other big thing was in commercial properties, the Hakuoni, 1.3 million um, additional expend expenditures for lot L for repairs. Um, so I just, you know, I would, I would, can I can I add also? I would say this five million is probably the biggest unplanned amount in our yes. entire budget, trustees. And so Mona is accounting for this five million with being part of that spend rate. That yes. is by far the biggest bucket mm -hmm. in, in a one-time unforeseen event that was not planned for when we were budgeting last year. Trustee Ahuna. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I was just wondering, what is the like the roundabout number of residents in, with homeowners and renters? Do you do we actually know kind of like a amount? Does anybody know? I I think put putting it together was around three thousand, and that includes you know families, in, individual in the families, not not individual families. So we. Um, I think um, our CEO divided it up according to what we think the families numbered around 220 renters and 350 uh, lost their homes. So that would be under 5 million, so perfect. Yep. Not really. We took about the whole 5 million. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ohana. Yeah. I, I think uh, we'll definitely be able to answer your question, Trustee, when we get the list, and then um, yeah. because these are these are estimate estimates, obviously, because we needed to put the proposal together, but we'll have a more definitive number soon. Yeah. Mahalo.
If there are no further um, questions, um, um, Mr. We will, Chair, we'll follow up soon. Um, trust, Trustee Lindsay. I'd like to move for adjournment. Um, is, there, is there a second? Can I can I add one no, thing before we close? Yes, yes, Trustee, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. Can trustees? Please. I'm so sorry. Can I add one more thing before we close? I I want to acknowledge one thing about this 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 monumental amount that the trustees approved for five million. I, I also want to note that this is this will be the first time OHA is going to be directly giving money to individuals. Historically, we we normally give it to organizations, but this is going directly to the individuals. And I want to acknowledge the team across OHA's administration that came together to stand up the process to be able to do this for its inaugural year. Um, to be able to do this um, in a quick time in response to your folks' directive, trustees, I commend the team. It was a cross-functional team across almost every division that came together. Uh, and they came together to put up the infrastructure to be able to deploy and disperse the money. Our very first time, OHA is giving money directly to our beneficiaries in their hands. I just want to mahalo them. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. Um, <laughs> Uh, roll, roll call Trustee Ahuna? Aye. Trustee Akaka? Aye. Trustee Akina? Aye. Trustee Alapa? Aye. Trustee Lindsay? Aye. Trustee Souza? Aye. Chair Waihe'e? Yes. Seven yes votes.